President Stewart for those kind words. And I also want to thank her for her leadership of this great college over the last year. Uh, it is not easy these days being a president of anything. <laughs> and I appreciate uh, the dedication and the great results from her leadership uh, here in Hamilton. And of course, where else could I have come that I would feel so much at home? Some people call me the hill. And right here in Clinton, I know that means a lot. And to be back in Oneida County and the Mohawk Valley and Central New York is a special treat for me. This college is entering its third century of excellence. That's quite an accomplishment. And it could not have happened without dedicated leadership, excellent students, loyal alumni, and a community that appreciated and supported those three centuries now nearly of forging a path for a college that is so well known for doing what higher education is supposed to do, inculcating values and information and a way of thinking and even, yes, a way of living. So I would like us all to give a big round of applause for the three centuries now of excellence right here at Hamilton College. We have some elected officials in the audience, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you here, the mayor of Syracuse, local assemblymen, others whom I have served with, both in the past and who are still serving now, Democrats and Republicans alike. You know, for eight years, when I did have the privilege of representing New York in the United States Senate, I would tell everyone who would listen to me that upstate New York is a land of treasures. History is everywhere. What built this country and made it the land of opportunity for so many really started here. World-class colleges and universities alongside dairy farms and apple orchards. And I took very seriously the representation of all of you and your interests. And I knew how important it would be to keep thinking about the future. That's what you try to do here at Hamilton learning to think critically and write clearly and speak persuasively. That's what has been taught here since George Washington's time. And Hamilton graduates have gone on to push the boundaries of human knowledge, to create great works of art, to start businesses, to help lead our country. In fact, one of my predecessors, L.A. Hugh Root, from the class of 1864, served as both senator for New York and Secretary of State. I like that combination. I'm glad that uh, he was there before me. My friend Tom Vilsack, the current Secretary of Agriculture, talks lovingly of his time here. And of course, it's where he met his wonderful wife, Christy, where they sent their son, Jess. Apparently, that's pretty common. Lots of Hamilton alums married each other. Now, we have a Hamilton alum right now serving over in Berlin as the U.S. Ambassador to Germany, John Emerson. Uh, but I meet Hamilton alum alums everywhere I go. I call some very close friends. Um, and it's because Hamilton is such a special place that I am particularly pleased that in recent years, the college decided to become need blind in admission, one of just over 60 schools in the country, to meet 100% of a student's financial need. Now that means that qualified young people from any family and background 
have a chance to study here without resources being an obstacle. And Hamilton has also recently answered President Obama's call to offer Say Yes scholarships to urban students from Buffalo and Syracuse. So Hamilton is not resting on its morals. You know, one thing that I've learned across my own life and that I've seen up close and personal over the last four years traveling the world is that talent, talent is universally distributed, but opportunity is not. We need to remember that in our own country these days. We have to make sure that we keep creating a path to opportunity for all of our young people. And that's what Hamilton has tried to do. And you, therefore, will continue to be a magnet for talent and a source of opportunity, and I thank you. Now, it's no wonder that Hamilton attracts students from 46 states and 40 countries. Your global reach is really what we look for today in any institution, because you've got to understand our interdependence and our interconnectivity, and we've got to be able to work in the world in a way that reflects our values as well as our interests. This feeds complex cross-cutting challenges like climate change, economic inequality, the proliferation of dangerous weapons and ideologies. But it also presents enormous opportunities for innovation and growth. So nations, businesses, colleges and universities, citizens alike, have to adapt to this new world because the only thing certain in a world that is changing as quickly as ours is change itself. How do you best prepare to be better, smarter, work more collaboratively? Education. That is still the key. It has been and I believe will remain so. And we also have to recognize that we're all in this together and take responsibilities to come up with answers to our global challenges. Now here at Hamilton, I've read about students who are committed to solving problems and serving others. This summer, Jared Joseph from the class of 2015 spent time in Haiti. I've been back in the country close to my husband's and my heart. We actually spent part of our honeymoon there many years ago. And she helped create a children's library and literacy program at an orphanage in Port-au-Prince. And she also convinced Steve Madden, the footwear company, where she worked a summer job, to donate boxes full of shoes to the orphans. See how that synergy works? A young woman with an interest in helping orphan children, but also as an entree into the business world, puts the two together. Closer to home, Nick Solano from the class of 2014 is leading a local home rehabilitation organization here in the Mohawk Valley called Rebuilding Together. Its volunteers help repair houses for the disabled, elderly, veterans, and they also renovate schools and nonprofit facilities. Nick started volunteering, got excited about the work, began writing grant proposals secured almost $20,000, and then ended up as executive director of the organization. The skills he needed were enhanced here at Hamilton for him to take an idea, visualize it, and figure out how to bring it to reality. Now, these are just two examples of students and many others who are looking at service in new ways and coming up with programs and policies that really answer to this challenge of our interdependence. And believe me, with all of the challenges we face and the sorry state of our own politics, we can use all the good role models we can find. So I'm looking forward to answering questions, but I want to take just a few minutes to share some of the lessons that I've learned representing New York and representing America and exploring three big challenges in particular. <coughs> gridlock, growth, and global leadership. Because they are all interconnected. First, gridlock, which is on everyone's mind today. 
Now, it's no secret that dysfunction and brinksmanship in Congress have finally reached a crisis. The federal government is shut down. We're flirting in Washington with a debt default that would have devastating effects on the American economy and ripple throughout the global economy. Now, of course, I know we've had plenty of partisan combat in the past. I've lived through my share of it. But it is hard to recall, in our own lifetimes, a previous time when politicians were willing to risk so much damage to the country to pursue their own agendas. Alexander Hamilton, for whom this college is named, was part of some pretty vicious debates with Thomas Jefferson and others. But the founders always came back to Benjamin Franklin's warning, either we'll hang together or we'll surely hang separately. So they compromise. Our founding documents are compromises, rooted in values, but reflecting the political give and take of their time. And when they won or lost elections, they accepted the results and began planning for how they could win the next election. When laws were passed, signed, and upheld by the courts, they worked to enforce them as the law of the land. And there was a sense that despite personal or partisan differences, the common good, the country's good, would eventually be served. Well, today, too many in our politics choose scorched earth over common ground. Many of our public debates are happening in what I like to call an evidence-free zone. <laughs> Where ideology trumps data and common sense. That is a recipe for paralysis, not progress. And it is not an example we should be setting for the world. Now, it doesn't have to be this way. There have been lots of difficult debates. I remember the last government shutdown back in 95 and 96. Uh, my husband was negotiating with then Speaker Gingrich over the budget. Sound familiar? And there were demands that the president do things that were politically difficult and not necessarily supported by the majority of the country at the time, but which were very important to uh, Speaker Gingrich and his party. Now, the Speaker would go on TV nearly every day and say pretty horrible things about my husband and about me too. And then he'd go to the White House at night. And he would sit down and start talking with Bill about what could be done. And Bill always started the conversation. You know, we have to open the government, and then we can talk about other things. Because no president, Republican or Democrat, in the 90s or in 2013, can abdicate the responsibility of the office. Can say, we're going to ignore legal responsibilities, court decisions. No, that's not the way our system must work. And eventually, the government opened, the shutdowns were over, and then began some positive, intense negotiations on important matters like a balanced budget. Neither side got everything it wanted, but they did balance the budget. And they did help to grow the economy. And the American people benefited from that. We watch what happens in Washington with a certain amount of bewilderment, even disgust. The rest of the world watches it closely. And when we let partisanship override citizenship, when we fail to make progress on the challenges facing our country, 
our standing in the world suffers. I happened to be in Hong Kong during the debt ceiling crisis of 2011, in July of that year. I was speaking to a large group of business leaders in Hong Kong from all over Asia and all over the world, and certainly China was well represented. They lined up to ask me questions about America's capacity to get our own house in order. Could the world still depend upon us as a global leader? Was the full faith and credit of the United States suddenly in doubt? Well, I quoted Winston Churchill. When in doubt, always quote Winston Churchill in occasions like this. I said, well, you know, I, I know it looks bad, but I have no doubt we will eventually work our way out of this and resolve our problems without a shutdown or a default. 